thank you again so much for coming. A tradition of reunion is that the dean talks about the state of the law school. And I think I have really good news to deliver, that I think this is a moment when the state of the law school is very strong. Every institution, including every law school, goes through ups and downs. You know, as well as I do, that there have been times when this institution has gone through hard times. And then I'd say the last couple of years were difficult because of COVID. But there's such a sense that we're coming back and coming back very strong. On Wednesday of this week, there was a panel put on jointly by the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society about the Supreme Court. Amanda Tyler and I were two of the speakers. And there were 250 people in attendance. We did it in room 105. And no matter when you went to law school, room 105 looks exactly the same now as it did then. <laughs> Every seat was taken with dozens of people standing in the aisles. They had bought 120 sandwiches for people. And there were you know, 130 people really disappointed that they didn't get their free lunch. But that event is reflective of what we're seeing every day now in the law school. Again, with speakers and symposia and programs. I had felt in my first years here that this was the most intellectually exciting law school that I've ever been part of. And I think that took a hit during COVID. I think our community took a hit. And it's wonderfully all back together. All of our classes are in person. All of our faculty meetings, faculty workshops, events are back in person. And it's just wonderful. Let me talk a little bit about why I think that the law school is doing well at this moment in time. And then most of all, I'm glad to take any questions you have about the law school. I've often said that the quality of any educational institution is a product of its faculty, its students, and its programs. So let me talk about each of these, then talk a bit about the challenges that we face right now and going forward. In terms of the faculty, we really have a terrific faculty. And not only are they great scholars, but they're wonderful teachers. I think this is the best teaching faculty part of I read all the student evaluations each semester for all the courses to really get a sense of how the students regard the professors. You probably have heard, or maybe if you've read my message, seen that US News does a specialty ranking. And I give a little more weight to these than overall ranking, because it's the professors in a field ranking the schools in that field. And this past April, the last rankings, Berkeley was number one in intellectual property again number one in environmental law, number one in business law, number two in criminal law, number six in international law, number seven in constitutional law, number eight in clinical education, number 10 in trial advocacy. We're one of only three law schools in the country to have so many rankings in the top 10. And it really does reflect the quality of the faculty. And something that's very exciting for us is we're continuing to expand our faculty. We had six offers accepted last year by individuals to join our faculty. Two are lateral. Hanok Degan's coming to us from Tel Aviv University Law School. He'd been the dean there. He's visited Harvard, Yale, Columbia, has had great interest from American law schools, just making the move. And I think it's a real coup that he's getting coming to Berkeley. Um, he specializes especially in legal theory and has teach contracts and property for us. Sharon Jacobs is one of the leading experts in the country in energy law. She was a professor at University of Colorado Law School, turned down offers from top 10 law schools to join us. Um, we have a number of new entry-level professors joining us this year. Um, Andrew Baker is going to teach corporations and securities regulation. David Hausman is teaching civil procedure this semester and will teach immigration law next semester. Emily Zhang is teaching civil procedure this semester and will teach election law next semester. And Stephanie Campos Bowie is joining us as assistant professor in the clinical program in our policy advocacy clinic. We have four other offers outstanding still to professors at other law schools. And we have about eight open slots still to fill this year that we're working on. So it's really exciting to see individuals turning down offers from the most prestigious law schools to come join us at Berkeley. Again, it's, I think, a measure of the quality of the law school and where we are right now. We always face a lot of retentions with our faculty. Many of our faculty are being recruited by other law schools. I think it's a testament 
to the quality of our faculty. I wouldn't mind if other schools showed a little bit less love to our faculty. <laughs> now, when we lose faculty, everyone notices. However, when we win retentions and keep faculty, no one knows. Um, last year, we had six retentions, all individuals having offers from top 10, I think in all the instances, top five law schools. Um, we kept three of the six. We lost three of the six. But it's something we're going to constantly continue to face. Um, but that's the faculty and where it is right now. And we're continuing to expand continuing to recruit just terrific people. In terms of the students, by every measure, the quality, the diversity of the students is increasing. Um, let me talk about the traditional measures of quality, the median LSAT and median GPA. This year, we have the highest median LSAT in the history of the law school. It's a 170 median. For those of you who went to law school when I did, when it was a different scoring system, 170 is really good. Um, we're one of only a few law schools in the country that have median 170. Maybe I can put it in context this way. When I arrived in 2017, our median was 167. This year, our 25th percentile is 167. And each year, we've gone up into this year being 170. Our median GPA is 3.84. And I'm very proud that as we've increased these medians, we have also substantially increased the diversity of the classes. This year, 54% of the entering 1Ls are students of color. 63% are women. To put this in some context, we again in each year are the law school of the top 20 with a larger percentage of women students. In terms of diversity, again, so you have a perspective, my first year here, 2017, we had 12 black students in the entering class. I was very worried that that would lead to a downward spiral, that fewer black students might want to come here, seeing how few were enrolled. We did extensive studies to figure out why it was we were struggling. And we learned that, thankfully, black students were applying. We were admitting them, but they were choosing to go elsewhere. So we developed a very aggressive strategy of reaching out and recruiting to those we admitted. We used a lot of our alumni to help with regard to this. And we more than doubled the number of black students in a year from 12 to 28. We then increased to 34 to 43. And we were able to stay at that percentage of the last couple of years, which is, I think, just something we need to continue to ensure. Thank you. If you want to know why we've been able to do this, it's because we've been able to substantially increase our scholarships. My first year here, our scholarship budget was $15 million. This year, our scholarship budget is over $27 million. And the way we would do that is through the support of the alumni. Um, I have taken all of what we've gotten from the alumni that's not earmarked designated funds and directed it towards scholarships. And that's where the money has come from. It's come from you. And it's what allows us to be successful in recruiting students. <coughs> We've had a bit of an anomaly in terms of the size of the entering classes. For some of you, when you came to law school here, it was about 270 in a class. Before I arrived here, they increased that to 320, and that was simply for economic reasons. And 320 has been the goal for many years. Two years ago, 320 was our goal. But we were worried that there was going to be a lot of students deferring because we were all online the 2020, 2020 year. And it turned out they didn't, so we ended up with 355 students. Well, that's more than we're really equipped for. So we decided last year to really come in no more than 320 and probably a little bit less. The admissions office took 10% fewer students. And we ended up with a class of 385. <laughs> We had the highest yield in the history of the law school. Usually, we yield about 30 to 32%. 40% of those who we accepted chose to come. Now, our CFO, Shivani Badia, was thrilled at this. <laughs> but we're not equipped for 385 students. We don't have the classrooms for it. We don't have the faculty for it. We don't have the lockers for it. We don't have the bathrooms for it. But we created an additional super mod we created additional legal writing sections to accommodate it. We looked at it as a wonderful embarrassment of riches to have these additional students. Um, 
And we decided that this year to take advantage of having a 3L class of 355 and a 2L class of 385, and we've set as our target 275. And so we have 279 1Ls this year. Um, I wish we could sustain that economically. I think it's a better number. I don't think it's financially sustainable. I think we're going to need to go in the long term to 310 to 320 is our annual 1L class. Um, we have 240 LLM students, what we call the traditional track LLM program. That's the students who come from August to May. We also have an executive track LLM program that is about 150 students. They come for either two summers or one summer and do the rest online. And the final part of what determines the quality of any educational institution is the programs. And for us, I think our programs are particularly geared towards our public mission. If you ask me what most distinguishes us from other top 10 law schools, it is our public mission. And this is reflected in so much of what we do. One of the statistics I'm most proud of with regard to Berkeley is that last year, almost 95% of our 1L students did pro bono work. And I challenge this year's class to beat that and make it as close to 100% as possible. We continue to provide grants to every student after the first year, after the second year, who wants to do public interest work. I've decided to call these Edley grants in honor of our wonderful prior dean, Chris Edley. Yeah. Um, we provide fellowships to a number of students after they finish law school. In fact, over the last few years, we've increased our funding for our public service programs for students by $1.8 million. Um, we're going to have to come up with an additional million dollars next year to make up for a, the University of California Office of the President ending a program that's been supporting us. But it's just crucial to who we are. Just this week, we approved changes on our loan repayment assistance program. This might affect some of you or part of that. It will make us the second best LRAP program in the country behind only NYU. And so these are really important for, for us and what we're doing. We're expanding our clinical program. We have a terrific clinical program. And I know some of you attended the session this morning about the death penalty clinic. Many of you participate in the clinics while you're here. But our clinics are too small relative to the size of the school. So a year ago, the provost approved our hiring five additional clinical professors over the next five years. Stephanie Campos Bowie, who I mentioned, it was hired in the policy advocacy clinic, the first of these. We just, in the last two weeks, interviewed three candidates to join our environmental law clinic as a clinical professor, so I nationalized first, and one in each of the next three years. Our centers are integral to what we do, and certainly integral to advancing our public mission. And so, in this regard, some of you have been involved in the Berkeley Center on Law and Business, the Berkeley Center on Law and Technology, the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, we have a wonderful Henderson Center on Social Justice. We've created a number of new centers just since I arrived. There's the Consumer Justice Program. There's the Berkeley Judicial Institute that Jeremy Fogel left the bench to head up for us. We have the Civil Justice Research Initiative. And I can give you a coming attraction within the next few weeks or months. We'll be announcing we're going to create a criminal justice center here. And we're going to create, and I don't know if we'll call it an Indigenous People Center or an Indian Law Center. Seth Davis and I were just talking about that at the end of the program. And so these are all really carrying forward our, our vision and, and our involvement in the community. So you put all this together, you can see why I say I think that this is just a really good time for the law school. Um, so what are the things I'm most concerned about regarding the school? Well, I'll list three before taking your questions. One is I'm always concerned about money. The reality is that at this moment in time, we get only about 5% of our budget net from the state, from the University of California. All of the rest needs to come from tuition or from what we raise. And it's a challenge. I mean, we don't have the involvement and the endowment of the schools that we compete with. Um, I wish it wasn't the case that our tuition needs to be at the same level as those schools. We're still the least expensive of the top 10 schools, but for both in-staters and out-of-staters, our tuition is over $60,000, and that's going to have to go up. 
and there's just no alternative. For a public university, there's only three choices. The state subsidizes, or you raise tuition, or you cut quality. And we're not gonna cut quality, and the state isn't subsidizing, so we have to raise tuition. And yet, the resources are always an enormous problem in this regard. I'm proud that we've been able to increase our development efforts, but we still need to do more. Um, when I came, our, we were raising about $18 million a year. This year and last year, we raised about $30 million. We need to increase that in order to be competitive and remain of the quality we want to about $50 million a year in terms of what we raise. I am really pleased that we have a new assistant dean for development alumni relations, who I think is exactly the right person to do that. Veronica, are you in the room? <laughs> Veronica Alexander was spent 20 years at UCLA Law School, including being the director of financial aid. We're very fortunate that we recruited her to be our, in our development department at UC Irvine. We worked together there for about nine years. Um, we discovered that neither of us has a very good sense of direction. We often lost our cars in the parking lot, but that's a different story. Um, Veronica left UC Irvine to come be the director of development at the School of Social Welfare at Berkeley. She was there for about four years, and we were able to lure her away and to be our development director, and she started here on June 1st. And I think she's exactly the right person to take our development to another level. Um, we also need to increase our annual giving. When I arrived, our annual giving was about 18%. Now it's about 20%. But you look at University of Virginia, that's over 50% of its alums give each year. University of Michigan's about 35%. So this, too, is a challenge that we face. And I think Veronica's the right person to deal with it. A second challenge we face, face is physical space. We are out of physical space. We don't have any more space to put additional faculty, additional clinics, anything like that. Those of you who've been to reunions or heard me speak in the last few years knew that we were planning an additional construction project. We were gonna take the empty old library stacks on the top floors of the law building and we were gonna convert them to usable space. When the new addition was built in 2012, the old library stacks on the top two floors were left vacant. Now it's just used for storage. And Charles Cannon, our terrific CAO and senior assistant dean, led up the project. And we went through all of the steps. We got all of the campus approvals. And there are an enormous number to do a construction project on this campus. We had all the money. It was going to cost us $20 million. We were going to break our piggy, piggy bank and use all of our reserves for it. And construction was supposed to start on Monday, May 17th of 2020. Well, in March 2020, when we saw that we we're going to have to shut down because of COVID, and I had enormous worries about what that would mean for our resources, especially the resources in the LLM program, I got in touch with the vice chancellor on campus, Rosemary Ray, and I said, I'm really worried to use all of our reserves at this point because I just don't know financially what's going to come next year. And we put the construction project on hold. We came back in August of 2021, and Charles got the estimate, and the same construction project would cost $27 million. And it was for less than 15,000 square feet of usable space, and it was space that was quite limited in what it could be because of the need for seismic reinforcements. And it would have been, according to the provost, one of the most constru expensive construction projects per square foot in the history of this campus. We don't have $27 million anyway, so it's not something we could do. So what we're looking for is alternatives. We're renting space now across campus. At, I think it's called the Golden Bear Center. I think it's about 6,000 square feet, is that right? OK. Um, and we're moving some of our centers there, the Berkeley Center on Law and Business, Berkeley Center on Law and Technology, the Center for Law and Energy and the Environment. It's not ideal that they won't be in our physical space, but it will free up space that we need for additional faculty, additional clinics, and the like. Um, we're going to do a restroom conversion project. The large restrooms on the first floor perpendicular to the big classrooms. This summer, we're going to convert them into a se single sex restroom. Um, it's a million and a half dollar project to do that, but that's already underway. 
We're looking at a couple of other space projects that can get us some space. One of the things I really want to do is convert this auditorium into a much more attractive space. I'm teaching a class that happens to be meeting in a business school auditorium in Haas. You know, it looks so much nicer than this room. <laughs> um, so that's one of our projects, and the, the, the look to do that, um, and waiting to hear the cost estimates back from the architect on that. But I think the reality is we're going to need to build another addition to this building, or uh, building an uh, addition to the space in the parking lot. My guess is it'll probably take about 10 years from starting it to completion, but that means we've got to begin now the process of raising money and planning for it, because we just need the additional space for it. So that's one of the things I worry about. So I said I had three things that I'm really worried about. Had you talked to me on Wednesday, I would have had just two, the money and the space. But in the last couple of days, a third worry has developed that some of you are talking about. And that's the media and some distorted stories about Berkeley Law that have gone viral in the media just in the last couple of days. And if you haven't heard about it, you may. And if you have heard about it and I haven't talked about it, let me tell you a little bit about it. And if nothing else, you'll then know when people come up to you. I've gotten hundreds of emails. Um, I can read you the ones that I've just gotten this afternoon. Here's the full story. On the first day of the new semester, August 22nd, a student group, Law Students for Justice in Palestine, asked every student group to add to its bylaws a statement condemning Israel. They wanted the statement to be that the groups would promise not to invite speakers who supported Israel's, quote, apartheid policies, that they supported the boycott, divest, sanction movement, and they would have their members go through training about the plight of the Palestinians. I learned about this at 4 o'clock on the first day of the semester. I immediately reached out to students, especially the students of the Jewish Law Students Association, met with a number of people, and I sent a message to all the student groups on Thursday morning of that week, um, where I said students certainly have free speech rights, but I was very distressed by their message. We're committed that all views and ideas be expressed. To say that they won't invite speakers with certain views is inconsistent with our policy. I said that, um, as Chancellor Christa said, the boycott the best sanction movement is a threat to academic freedom, and that we want to be a place where all ideas and views should be expressed and that I hope when student organizations make a choice of what to do, they'll keep this in mind. I was pleased that no additional student groups adopted the bylaws after my message went out. About nine groups, and we have over 110 student groups, had adopted it up until then. The Jewish Law Student Association the following Monday put out their statement. This got some media attention at the end of that week, August 22nd, especially there was some coverage in the Jewish press. I wrote an op-ed for one of the Jewish newspapers explaining what had happened. Um, and the issue seemed to largely fade away. That after uh, middle of the second week of school, I didn't hear anything about it from the students. No additional student groups adopted the bylaw. They either rejected it or ignored it. Um, the media coverage died down. And in fact, I got an email on Wednesday night from somebody in the campus communication saying that anything happened. I said, no, thankfully, the issue has faded. On Thursday, an article appeared in the Jewish Journal that's titled, Berkeley Creates a Jewish Free Zone. And the article said that because of the policies adopted by student groups, Jewish speakers are no longer welcome at Berkeley. The article had nothing to do with the reality of what was happening in the school. No one, to my knowledge, has been excluded from speaking. No one has been discriminated against. No students have complained to me about discrimination. No faculty have complained about discrimination. This article quickly went viral. It got picked up by Fox News. Um, Barbara Streisand tweeted about it yesterday. Um, there was a statement on Reddit this morning that I'm not Jewish, though my name is Jewish. Um, I am Jewish, by the way. Um, um, I've gotten a, a, an organization in New York said that they won't 
hire any of our, they're going to allow, encourage law firms not to hire any Berkeley students until Berkeley changes its discriminatory policy. We don't have a discriminatory policy. Um, I've written an op-ed that's going to appear in a newspaper. I wrote a letter to the editor of the Jewish Journal that appeared. Um, the truth is, at this point, less than 10 student organizations of 110 adopted by law. Some of them are reconsidering having done so. Um, no one has been discriminated against. There's no Jewish free zone. No one has been discriminated against. And I'm hopeful that this will all fade soon, but it's sure causing a lot of drama at the moment. That, that's the full story about it. Um, so those are the things that make me feel really good about where the school is now. This is external to the school, and I'm confident that this tool will fade. I think with that, I'll just say you can ask me about anything you want. Glad to take any questions. Please. <laughs> you know, I'm prepared to talk about so much. Um, Though I will tell you, the first year that I came to the, the reunion, I had a red tie on. And my wife, who was a Berkeley Law graduate class of 86, said, you can't wear a red tie. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand. She says, that's Stanford colors. So I have a blue tie on. Um, I confess to you, I have nothing to do with the banners. But I will raise that question with those who designed them. Please, ask anything you want. Please. We have no age discrimination yes. policy. Is you have no eighty-year-old entering students. You have no percentage. <laughs> but as I said to you, I, we did alumni receptions in Los Angeles on Wednesday night and Thursday night. And one of the wonderful things is just going to be in person for things like that and things like this. But as I said. We have accepted, to my knowledge, 100% of the 80-year-olds who have applied to the law school this year. <laughs> uh, 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 by the way, if you are interested in the average age, of the average age of the cl entering class is 25 years old. I think the oldest entering student this year is 43. Um, but if you know of 80-year-olds who are interested in coming, we don't engage in age discrimination. And um, as proof, Probably most of you, in fact, I'm sure all of you in this room were here when Dick Buxbaum was a professor, right? Yeah. Dick is still in the law school every day. He's 92. And I just wish that all of us not only lived to be 92, but lived to be 92 like Dick Buxbaum. Yeah. He's just amazing. <laughs> I will tell him of your applause. He is just doing great. Um, other questions? Anything? So when we were here, um, one of the treasured series of classes we had were called small sections. And yeah. when we our first year we had only Still do. class of 30. And I just wonder if that Oh absolutely. Was absolutely. Every now the first year curriculum has changed since virtually any of you were here because we decreased the number of requirements. No law well the only four required classes are civil procedure, contracts, torts, and criminal law. Now, students have to take constitutional law at some point after from their second semester of law school on, but that's it in terms of requirements. So, for example, property is no longer a required class. Most students will take it, but this is part of a trend. <laughs> well, you can cheer, but, but it's part of a trend nationally, especially among the elite law schools, of giving students more electives and allowing them to choose the classes that they want to take. By the way, we do have a new requirement that will start in August, the class that enters August 2023. All students will have to take a course on race in the law sometime between the second semester of their first year and graduation. Of those four classes that I mentioned, every student will have one of them in a small mod. In this year, the small mods are 30 students each. It's, there's nine small mods. Um, there's three super mods, and each th super mod is divided into three small mods for one of those classes. And so the small mods are all, you know, there's 279 students, so it's basically 31 um, in each of the small mods. And we're committed to doing that. That's not going to change. Um, and I do think it's a very special, and we provide money for the professors to do social events with the students in their small mods. So that, that continues and won't change. It's not a question, it's just a Anything. statement. If you did, uh, did you get the microphone? I received my um, 
LLM. I'll be 80 years old in November. That's wonderful. I, re I received it in I received it in 2018. Thank you so much for saying that. See, there's no age discrimination going on here. It's, uh, uh, Dominic's got the microphone. It's probably that's easier, so everyone can hear your question. Yeah, um, curious about the breakdown between in-state and out-of-state students coming in. We do not have any preference for in-staters or any preference for out-of-staters, and it varies year to year. This year, we're 45% in-state and 55% out-of-state. Most years, it's the reverse, and we're usually a bit more in-state than out-of-state, um, but it just varies depending on the year. But this year, interestingly, we're majority out-of-state, but that's just uh, how it falls. The admissions office pays no attention to that in the admissions process. And you know, we, the in-state tuition preference isn't that much larger than the out-of-state tuition what, preference. What is um, I think this year it's about $6,000. I think it's about 60 for in-state and about 66 for out-of-state. And if I'm off, I'm off by a very small amount. Why do you think a lower percentage of Berkeley Law alums contribute than the percentage at other schools? Good question. I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I think there's many things. I think Berkeley was relatively late, even compared to other public schools, in coming to the recognition of the need to engage in fundraising. That because the state was subsidizing, it wasn't perceived as necessary. I think we have less history of having the infrastructure for development. And we, I think we tremendously ex improved that, um, but we still need to further expand our development staff and, and in, in that way. I don't think Berkeley has historically done a very good job in instilling in students from the time they arrive that they're gonna be expected to give back. I spent 21 years at the University of Southern California on the faculty. They instill in students from the moment they arrive on campus that you're gonna be expected to give back. One of the things that our development office has done a wonderful job in the last few years is beginning to do that. They've created a program called Berkeley Alumni in Residence. Um, every Monday they provide coffee to the, free coffee to the students. Erin Deneen does a great job in running this program. Um, they do, a, it, the, for first semester students before their first exams, give them a, a care package uh, from the development office. They do a midway through law school, halfway through law school party. All things that have just developed is part of instilling in them. Um, my predecessor in this role, Melissa Murray, who was the interim dean, said, you know, she went to Virginia as an undergraduate and then was here at Berkeley Law School. She says, you know, people go to Virginia to embrace it and people go to Berkeley to fight the man. And so it's just harder to get people then to embrace it in, in, in annual giving. Um, I think some of all of that contributes. I'm pleased that it's increasing, but we, we need to do more. Um, and, and I think our ability to continue to be a top law school is gonna depend on our ability to raise the money, because it's a cap to how much we can do through tuition. Dean, um, what, what are you doing, or what have you done since we were all in law school about getting students more practical education in their second and third year? I think compared to when many people here in law school, there's been a dramatic expansion in the clinical programs, a dramatic expansion in the field placements, and an enormous expansion in the pro bono program. Let me talk about all of this. Our clinical program has two wonderful components. One is the East Bay Community Law Center, and the other is our in-house clinics. And I would say probably close to 70% of our students will do a clinic while they're in law school here through either one of those things. And as I say, we're, we're hiring five more clinical professors in the next five years, and then staff attorneys and fellows to support them. So that will further expand the clinic program. We have a terrific field placement program where students get academic credit for working 
in judges' offices, um, public defender's office, prosecutor's offices, public interest. And Sue Schechter does a magnificent job of that. And every year it's grown. And I think we're now close to about 130 students a semester are doing that program. And then there's the pro bono program where students are doing pro bono work under the supervision of a lawyer. And as I said to you, last year, almost 95% of the first year students did one of these, which we call the SLIPS program. Um, we hired a full-time director, Deborah Schlossberg, who does a great job with it. We've given her additional staff. So you put those things together. There's virtually no student here who won't have some practice experience under the supervision of a lawyer before graduating. But we need to do more. Our clinics are too small relative to the program that we have. We do need to provide more opportunities. I'd like us to see the point where we have enough clinical opportunities that every student can do a clinic while here. And if it were up to me, I would require every student to do a clinic in order to graduate. I had the wonderful opportunity for coming here of being the founding dean of the law school at University of California, Irvine. And it requires every student to do an in-house clinic before graduation. We don't have the capacity to do that. We're ways away from that. But I think compared to what it used to be, even compared to what it was five years ago, there's been substantial expansion. Yeah, Dean, uh, you are a constitutional, constitutional scholar. Uh, in California, why is it that we have such a hard time getting our alums appointed to the California Supreme Court? <laughs> you need to elect one of our alums to be governor. Uh, um, uh, I have to tell you, the, the governors never, neither this nor the private governor ever consult me on who they think should be appointed to the California Supreme Court. There's wonderful alums on, and I could name names of courts of appeals. Um, and um, without giving away any of the confidential, when there was the last vacancy, I actually did reach out to the governor's Judicial Appointment Secretary, who's a Berkeley Law graduate, and um, suggested a Berkeley Law grad who's a Court of Appeal judge, justice for that. Um, but they, he picked other people. Um, but and I think it's not just the California Supreme Court. I think there needs to be Berkeley graduates on the US Supreme Court. Um, Earl Warren was the prior. So I don't have an answer to the question. But I think it's a, a clear failing of both Governor Newsom and Brown. Hi, thank you. Uh, I was wondering what your views are on the future of OCI in hiring of law students. Um, at least at my firm and many of my colleagues' firms, it's happening earlier and earlier. And this year, we hired almost entirely before OCI even started. Um, so how does that play into recruiting future law, Berkeley law students, which I'd love to have more of? Yeah. Um, if you, right, OCI is on-campus interview. And when some of you went to law school, it occurred right at the beginning of the semester. And I'm seeing nods. And then it got earlier, and then it became before the semester, and goes on at the beginning of August. And it still goes on. And a large number of law firms, a small number of government and public interest places participate. And a very significant percentage of our students participate and get summer jobs through it. But as the question indicated, more law firms are deciding to hire outside of the OCI process. And you said your firm did almost entirely before. I'm not thrilled with that development. I mean, I think the nice thing about OCI is it provided a very regularized process. The place of employment indicated that they were going to come and interview. Students signed up. We had a process for that. And it was very open to everybody to participate. The more it goes on outside of OCI, the less it's open to everybody. Um, there's another development that I think is a bad one, but the market is dictating it. Until this year, first year students were told that they couldn't work with the Career Service Office till December 1st. And after December 1st, they could then work with the career services and apply for jobs. And this was trying to get first semester students not to focus on jobs, but to focus on the very intense experience of the beginning of law school. The market made that impossible. This year, there's no time limit, because what we found was that we could say don't apply till December 1st, 
but they were applying in September and places of employment were reaching out to them. And so what we can do now is try to advise them. They don't need to worry about it. They don't need to. If they are, here's how to go, to, go about it. So I think what your question indicates is, is that we don't control the market. You know, law firms can recruit when law firms want to recruit. Students can apply when students want to apply. But the less it is a regularized process open to everybody, the more I think some will be at a disadvantage. And I mean, I'm the first in my family not only go to go to law school, the first in my family to go to college. I didn't know any lawyers until the first law professor I met who was a lawyer. I would have had no idea how to apply for a job but for there being a regularized process. And I think that there will be a disadvantage to first generation students who don't know this is how you apply to law firms or this is what they're doing, other than OCI made that much more regularized. But I think what the law school, to answer your specific question, the law school has to adapt to the market. What we want to do, my goal as a dean is to try to help every student find the job that he or she most wants. For the students who want to go to big law, I want us to help them. For the students who want to go to public interest or government, I want to help them. For the students who want to go to clerkships, we want to help them. That's what our goal is, and it should be. Dominic's got the microphone. There seems to be, or at least there's a perception that around the world right now we have a real issue with polarization and populism, right? And lawyers, we've sort of seen in the last couple of years, especially January 6th hearings and all, that lawyers are among the people that are supposed to be holding up the rule of law and preventing people from just getting the results they want, certain people like president, et cetera. In any event, there's also a perception that Berkeley is, is more left than any place else and more activist and that perhaps it's not about the rule of law, which I would disagree with, but I'm just curious, is there, you know, obviously all of us in this room should believe in the rule of law as opposed to just getting what we want. Of course, we may want to use the rule of law. We hope for certain outcomes. But I'm just curious if in our education here at Berkeley, we're still instilling that notion. I mean, some people have talked about, other law schools have talked about having special classes on the rule of law, which seems silly to me. It seems like every class should be infused with this notion of the rule of law. But I'm just curious if you could address sure. how that's being done here at Berkeley. Let me try to break that down step by step. I want Berkeley law to be a place where all ideas and views get expressed and discussed. We have liberal students, but we have conservative students. We have American Constitution Society, which is more on the left but we also have a Federalist Society chapter. We have liberal professors. We have some outspoken conservative professors. We have many professors where I don't know their ideology at all. Um, I was talking to a professor I've been a colleague with for five years, and we were discussing originalism, and I didn't realize that he was quite politically conservative. But that's the way it should be. We should be a place where all the views get expressed. I spent a lot of time at 1L orientation in this room talking to the first year students about how they should want it to be that place. And they should want to have all the views expressed. They should hear the arguments on both sides, because no matter what their beliefs, they'll be strengthened by hearing the opposing position. So I'm very committed to that. Um, I agree with you that I think the rule of law should permeate our curriculum. Now, I think we need to talk about, and probably beyond the scope of this conversation, what do we mean by the rule of law? I always think, for example, that the rule of law means that no one, not the president, not the dean of law school, no one is above the law. And that seems to be very important. The rule of law seems to me that we follow procedures even-handedly, that the rule of law is one way in which we're supposed to have protection from discrimination. And I think that law schools do and have to emphasize that. Um, I think that part of what you say, I'm not sure whether we would agree is part of the rule of law. I don't believe, for example, in my field, constitutional law, there's ever decisions that are, in major cases, apart from the ideology of the justices. I don't think there's a value neutral judging, certainly when it comes to those kinds of cases. Um, Marbury versus Madison wouldn't have come out the way it did, but for John Marshall. From the 1890s and 1936, the court struck down 200 federal, state, and local laws protecting working consumers because of the conservative ideology. The Warren Court decisions were the product of the ideology was on the bench. In the cases we were just talking about, if Hillary Clinton had won as president in 2016 rather than Trump, and had she replaced justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Ginsburg, 
Roe versus Wade wouldn't have been overruled. The gun case wouldn't have come out that way. Um, so I don't believe that the rule of law is that there's constitutional law apart from the ideology of the judges, because I don't think that's possible. When I have an, a, a court of appeals argument, I want to know as soon as I can who's my panel, because I know that's likely to make a difference in the outcome, but I don't see that as inconsistent with the rule of law. What I'm trying to teach my students, though, is how to make the best arguments they can, whoever their judges will be, but being mindful who the judges are is going to affect on what's going to be the outcome of the case. I see a hand there. I'm curious. Um, we're all class of 2012, and we're trying to remember exactly what our tuition was, which was not low either. But it seems like tuition now is about what? We were around 40 something, now it's something around 60. And just wondering in the last decade, what's driving such a high increase in tuition? Like what is the, what's driving the increasing cost of legal education? Oh, over the last I think decade? there's two parts to that question. One part to the question is, what's driving the increase in the Berkeley tuition? And the second is, what's driving the increase in the cost in higher education generally? For Berkeley, the answer is easy. State funding has gone down. That my wife graduated from Berkeley Law in 1986, and she paid $750 a semester in tuition. The state at that point was paying between 90 to 95% of the budget of the law school. This year, our budget is $130 million. If you look at our sources of revenue in a pie chart, about 5% of that revenue comes from the state. That means we have to make up the difference from tuition. And tuition provides about 60% of our revenue. So that's why our tuition has gone up so much. And I wish I could say there's going to be a point at which the state goes back to subsidizing professional schools in California. I don't see it happening. And so we have to operate in a model almost identical to private schools. That means high tuition, and it means being very dependent on fundraising. The harder question is, why is the cost of higher education generally gone up so much? And isn't a lot of things, because for all of you who have put children to college, you know that the tuition that I'm talking about is now typical. I had four kids, all of whom went to private schools, two of them went to private law schools, so I can speak firsthand about the increase in cost. Um, and I think that's a really hard question that I don't know the answer to, and I've not seen anyone come up with. Now, I can tell you in terms of our budget, I'm glad to share everything our, our budget, but 68% of our budget goes to faculty and staff salaries and benefits. About 20% of our, well, you can do the math, 27 million out of 130 million, so um, you can figure out what that is percentage-wise, goes to scholarships. So you've automatically now taken a substantial part of the budget just from that. Um, there's no doubt that faculty salaries and staff salaries have gone up, faculty salaries especially have gone up. Um, we operate in a market, and in order to attract faculty, we have to pay competitive salaries. Um, the size of faculties has gone up. When I was at Irvine, as the founding dean, spent a lot of time looking at law school economics. The only way to create a lo low-cost law school is to have a very tiny faculty rely almost on lecturers for all instruction, and have almost no staff to serve the students. And that wouldn't be a very good law school. Now, compared to when many of you are in law school, the staff has gone up. Um, we have many more staff in the career services office than probably when many of you went to law school. Many more staff in the dean of students office. Um, we now have four staff in career services who just focus on helping students who want to do public interest in government work. Um, we just hired someone in the Dean of Students office about two years ago to do nothing but work with students with disabilities on accommodations. All of those, when you add them up, lead to greater cost. But the underlying question, why has the cost of higher education gone up so much, I don't have a good answer for. There's a question here. Oh, no, go ahead. Use this so everyone can be sure to hear you. Having, and they're also recording this so they can hear it. Oh, all right, okay. Uh, having said that, how much of your time is spent fundraising? A, a lot, um, and, <laughs> and not nearly enough. Um, it was harder during the COVID years. 
So much of fundraising is having events like this with people in person, or going to meet people, having lunch, or coffee. I mean, I've had some of you, we've had the chance to have breakfast, lunch, or dinner together. Um, and I couldn't do that during COVID. And it's just resumed again, really, since last spring. I mentioned we did an LA event on Wednesday night downtown, an LA event on Thursday in Century City. This was part of my contribution to law school, as I explained to them, you can't just do an event in LA. You have to do two, one on West Side and one downtown, because people who work and live on the West Side aren't going downtown, and people who live and work downtown or in that part of the city aren't going to the West Side. Um, we're doing a New York event on Thursday, November 3rd. We're doing a San Francisco and a Silicon Valley event coming up. We're doing a DC event in January. Um, so we just need to do more like that. I need to go out and meet you individually and have breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, and just need to do much more. It was hard to do that over Zoom. Um, so, and I really enjoy it. I wouldn't be the dean if I didn't. Um, I really believe in this school, and this is my chance to try to sell my dreams of the school to hopefully those who want to support it. And I can't say enough how much the support from our alumni is absolutely integral to everything that we do. So it's a lot of my time, but I'm thrilled to do it. It's, it's why I want to be dean. There's a question in the back. I, I was just wondering, a lot of these questions um, uh, sort of intersect over the notion of public trust as a constitutional concept. And it seems that the education, the education of lawyers especially, um, that lawyers sort of want the public to forget about the role of the public trust in law. And um, instead of undermining it, I was wondering um, what Berkeley Law was doing to build up public trust, because a lot of this finger pointing is, you know, what, what, what's the economist or whatever. It's, it's, a lot of the problem is law and economics. And um, the notion of demand and the notion of supply. And um, is there any ethical commitment to um, re-educating lawyers about the public trust and, and what the procedures are? Let me answer your question more generally and then try to become more specific in responding. I think there's generally a crisis in this country with regard to public trust in government and in all institutions. During the Trump presidency, approval ratings were in the low 30s. A lot of the time that Biden's been president, approval ratings were in the low 30s. The Supreme Court, as was alluded to in the panel, has its lowest approval ratings in history. Last September, a Gallup poll had a 40% approval and a 53% disapproval. A Marquette University poll in July of this year had it with a 38% approval, and almost a 60% disapproval. Congress approval rating is 18, and that might be 18 people, not 18%. <laughs> I don't think this is a short-term phenomenon. I think I can show you that it stems from the Vietnam War and Watergate, and ever since then, there's been a decrease in trust in institutions. And I think most people can't draw a distinction between federal courts and state courts, or between the Supreme Court, other courts. And I think as the Supreme Court's legitimacy is eroded, so is the legitimacy of all of the judiciary. And this is part of what makes me really worry about the future of democracy in this country. Can democracy survive with such low level of trust in government? And now you particularly point to the trust in lawyers. We do require that all students take a course in ethics in order to graduate. I would hope that ethics permeate all of the classes that we teach. I don't think you can just be assigned to one course in the curriculum. I've talked with some who are in this room about the possibility of creating a center here at Berkeley 
that relates to ethics and government. Um, so there's much more that we can do. And if you have suggestions about what we can do, I welcome your suggestion. It's not that we're unmindful of it. Um, I think the question is, what can we do that would most make a difference? And I welcome ideas. Uh, could, Berkeley law, could Berkeley law significantly increase its student body by using more reliance on distance learning? No, we can't, and I can explain why. And no, we shouldn't, and I'll explain why. The can't is ABA rules impose very strict restrictions on distance learning. The ABA suspended those rules during COVID, but they're not going to continue to suspend the rules. Now I'm going to tell you, even if they suspended the rules, why well, I don't think we should. And it's the experience that COVID taught, at least me and many of my colleagues. We can teach by distance learning when we need to, but it's not the same educational experience as in-class learning. Um, I taught classes all of two years ago, as did all of my colleagues, that were entirely online. Um, I that year taught federal courts in the fall and constitutional law in the spring, and I taught three seminars that year on civil liberties in a pandemic, for one for 1Ls, one for upper-level students, and one for LM students. I did it, but it wasn't the same as being in the classroom. Um, and I think that if you talk to my colleagues, the overwhelming sense was that something is missing in terms of what you can do in a classroom and the engagement in the classroom that you just can't get through online education. So we very much made the choice to embrace in-person education. Um, our position is that the first year of law school is inherently interactive and participatory, and students have to be here. There are some upper-level classes, that, like trial advocacy, that are just interactive and participatory. And there are some upper-level classes where remote options might be possible. But overall, I think we're really going towards embracing there's something special about being in the classroom and being in the building together. Um, so again, we can't do it because of the ABA, but my experience as an instructor is I don't think it's the same, and I don't think we should go down that path. There may be schools that will make a different choice than that. And I, I don't know how much, even if we could, it would help our revenue, because if you do it, there's all sorts of costs that we learned two years ago attendant to being online education. With that, let me just say thank you so much for being here. I look forward to being at the reception and coming to all your dinners tonight. Thank you.